Hello, I'm Phil Bleasy. Well, all the instruments I made um, are made from hardwood, and only some hardwoods are suitable for what I do. Something that's been used over a lot of years is African blackwood, and that's the wood you see used for making clarinets and oboes and stuff like that. Pretending not to use so much of it now because CITES have put it on their endangered list. A good replacement for it is Mopani, an African wood which plays just as well as blackwood does. It's very pretty, it looks like the old rosewoods, many of those are endangered now as well. But Mopani is not endangered in any way. If I want to avoid using the exotics, I can use European stuff that's very easy to replace. Olive, yew, which is a bit of an odd one because it's not a hardwood, but it behaves like one when it comes to making instruments. Something I've picked up just recently here in Lancaster from the Priory is this, which is Norway maple, which works very, very well. And the one that everybody really wants to go for is boxwood. Boxwood I buy in from whatever source I can, and I buy it in like that in logs. The first thing I do is cut it in half, because when it shrinks, as you can see, <clears throat> it develops a split. Okay, I'm going to turn this piece of boxwood into a round piece ready for machining up into a flute. We're going to start off by cutting the end off square. Okay, so we're now going to take our square blank and we're going to turn it into a cylindrical blank. Bear in mind I'm an engineer and I'm working with an engineering lathe, so that's the way forward. And in there, good and tight, block everything up. do is we're going to drill a cylindrical hole through the middle of that blank. So what I use is a thing called a gun drill. It's a very clever piece of kit. As you can see it has a groove pressed in it and it is hollow. To get the drill to cut in the middle it starts off by running through a bronze bush which is supported in the steady in the lathe. We switch the air on and just allow the drill to go in one pass all the way through without blocking up and straight out again, so we don't get any problems with it wearing the wood out. And there it is, with a nice parallel hole right through the middle. So the next thing we're going to do, having got the hole through the middle of our piece of wood and cut it tapered if we need to, is to put sockets and tenons on the ends of all the various bits so that they fit together. This is a metal tuning slide that's going to go in this instrument and it fits into a socket there and in this case is glued in. The other end is socketed with a slightly different diameter to accept the next wooden joint on the flute and we'll see that later. So we've now got the joint to the instrument up in the lathe again and we're going to cut the socket in it with a boring bar. tenth of a millimeter oversize so we get a nice easy fit. And there's the socket. So now we've got the sockets cut in on the female sides of the joints of the instrument. Now we're going to cut the tenons on the center joint or the left hand joint of the flute so that we can fit it all together. size of it. 
Okay, so our tenon cut on one end, we're going to go down to the other end of the instrument and cut the other tenon. finished left hand joint. There are the two tenons ready to fit into the other parts. The centre piece is now tapered. We have a tapered bore through the middle. What we've got to do is drill the finger holes in there and glue the cork on. Okay so now we've got our middle joint or left hand joint of the instrument finished turned. This is the foot joint which is not yet finished turned but we have got the tapered bore inside and we've done the socket so we can see that those two pieces fit together. The next piece up the instrument is the barrel which holds the tuning slide that is socketed and fits on to the left hand joint. The tuning slide itself is made of two pieces of tube one of which is brass the other one is silver plated brass. They fit and slide tightly together silver plated side goes in to the barrel and then the head joint of the instrument accepts the other half of the tuning slide and that assembled is our low D whistle waiting to be finished. Okay so having got all the bits of the instrument finished turned and assembled we're now going to address the voicing of the instrument and we're going to cut the window and the windway. The window is this piece here with a ramp in front of it and we're going to cut that on this machine which is a copy router. The wind way is the bit inside there which goes through where you breathe into and joins up with the window at this point and we're going to cut that on another machine afterwards. Here's one that's been cut in half cross sectioned and there you can see the ramp and the window and the wind way which is made by cutting a groove in the top of the instrument and putting a wooden block underneath it. Right. The machine we're going to do it in is called a copy router. I've already got a pattern here and it's only going to rough the thing out. I'm going to finish it by hand later on, but we're going to rough it out now. And you'll see as I come over, the router is on this side and does the cutting here. And there's a stylus here, which follows the pattern. You can see that ramp and window roughed out and now we can look through there and see the cutter when we cut the windway which is going to be cut through from the inside. Let's go over to the other machine. So we've got the window roughed out which is the little hole across the top here. What we're now going to do is cut the windway. And the windway on a quality instrument is a quite complex shape. It's curved left and right and it is also curved front to back. And the way we do that is with a machine that I've built myself. The cutting tool is curved to give us that left to right curvature. And back here underneath is a template which has the curve in it. And this arm follows the template up and down. And that is what gives us the curve back to front in the top of the windway. So we've got an end stop that allows the cutter to stop in the window there and it's just pulled mechanically backwards and forwards and this handle gradually raises the cutter as you can see now that's taking cuts out of the inside of the head joint to check how far up we cut I'm going to use these little tiny step gauges again all handmade here in the workshop 
There we have it, the step inside the instrument of nine tenths of a millimetre. Okay, now we've got the ramp and the window roughed out, the windway has been cut. I'm now going to hand finish that ramp, and while I'm doing it, I'm generating a very fine lip of the end, which has to be half a millimetre thick. And I'm watching that in the little rear view mirror so that I can see when I've got the thickness just right. Yeah, that's the ramp, more or less the right thickness. I'm now going to use a pair of left and right handed chisels, possibly even knives is a better description. I'm going to use those to cut the sides of the ramp. Leaning up right into the corners. And when it's finished, I'm only halfway through doing that one, it'll look like this one. And all we've got to do then is fit the block into it, finish the top of the block, and we should have a playable instrument. Okay, so here we've got a finished instrument with its metalwork in place and you can see that each of the sockets, which is a very fragile area, is reinforced with a metal ring. The same on the sockets in the head joint. And within the head joint is the tuning slide, which is two pieces of tube which telescope together. They're made from stock brass tube from that stock tube, I cut rings, which have inside them a little spiral groove to pick up the glue. I cut the two pieces for the tuning slide, which have a knurled pattern on again to pick up the glue. Same on the internal one. They don't fit perfectly together when you buy the tube. And on top of that, half of it has been silver plated so the diameter changes slightly. So the tube has to be redrawn through a die in order to get it to be a nice smooth sliding fit, but not too sloppy because you don't want it falling apart while the player is using the instrument. They are then fixed onto the instrument with an epoxy resin glue. The top of the instrument has a groove underneath. Glue is applied both to the inside of the metal and the outside of the wood it's put together, cleaned off with methylated spirits and left to set. Similarly, the tuning slide, glue applied around the knurled pattern. Inside the joint as well, there are grooves that pick up the glue. They're slid together, left to set, and then we've got an instrument that can be assembled and we can start to tune and get the thing working properly. Okay, the next thing that has to be fitted into the instrument is the block and the block is made of pencil cedar. We use pencil cedar because it's absorbent and it allows the top surface of the block to wet out quite quickly and stops droplets of moisture from forming inside the windway which is the bane of the plastic recorder. You can see the windway is cut down the inside there when the block is fitted it closes off the bottom of the windway and we have a nice smooth curved channel. Some of the voicing work is done by curving the top of the block and by putting a little chamfer on the front. And similarly, inside the window, a little chamfer is put on the top of the windway. And those two chamfers work like the flute player's lips. And when the instrument's assembled, by changing those chamfers, we can just subtly change the angle at which the air crosses the window and is split by the lip and it's that split there that creates the vibration which makes the instrument work and by having that um, that sheet of air that crosses the window 
strike that blade in the right place, we can get the instrument to play good strong bottom notes and jump the octave and play good clear high notes as well. We can easily make a mistake and get it to play one or the other, but the trick is to get it to play both. Okay, so by adjusting those two chamfers inside the voicing, we can then get the instrument to play across the octaves. So first of all, when the bottom chamfer goes on, we're looking to make a good powerful fundamental note. But we also want the instrument to jump the octave. And it's good to check and see if it will do the harmonics above that as well. And this one does it quite nicely. Okay, so the next thing we have to do, having got the voice working on the instrument, is to get the pitch of all the notes right. And the difficulty comes with the fact that any hole, and it's the first open hole that helps the note to, to sound at the right pitch, gives us two notes, one in each octave. So this is a G. And here's the same note, the G, in the second octave. The difficulty is that we've only got one hole to work on and we have to get both of those notes correct. Now this instrument is almost finished, but something that we can see just at the top of the instrument, the B note, is a little bit flat in the second octave. You can see because the needle doesn't come all the way up and the left hand red light is on. Now here it is again. In order to raise the pitch of that second octave, I've got to make this hole bigger, but the difference is that making it just bigger will only raise, or will raise mostly, the first octave. Moving it up and down the instrument will mostly raise the second octave. And so I'm going to be crafty and I'm going to make the hole bigger but only on one side so that I've effectively moved the hole slightly down the instrument. I'm going to do it with this little grinder. It's got a ball shaped tungsten cutter in the end of it. Hopefully we'll see that. Now we have the octaves nicely balanced. We do that for each of the holes. We work up the instrument and back down again a couple of times until everything's working perfectly and we've got a nice instrument. That There you had it, the low D whistle.